Um, although I, I might start actually by taking issue with the premise of this talk um, and picking up on something that Isabel uh, Mateo Silago said in that panel discussion just now. Um, climate change is uh, uh, not, it's, it's a new issue for capital markets, um, but increasingly I think I would, I would take her point that it's no longer just an ESG issue, no longer just an issue for green bonds. Um, I think you, if you wanted to sort of pick a date where it really entered the mainstream, uh, you might uh, pick uh, September last year when Mark Carney, the uh, governor of the Bank of England, um, uh, gave a speech in Lloyds of London um, in which uh, he, he uh, uh, proposed the establishment of a task force on climate risk disclosure and in particular um, mentioned that companies should be asked by investors uh, not only what they're emitting today, but also how they plan their transition to the net zero world of tomorrow. And this talk is going to be about understanding that, what, what, what he meant by that, what net zero means, and why this is an important long-term issue for all investors, not just investors in ESG. Um, so so uh, the, the, we need to sort of start with the context, with some facts. I've got a very familiar picture behind me of global temperatures, uh, which are now hovering around one degree above pre-industrial. Uh, the past four months have actually been extremely warm globally, uh, heading up towards uh, 1.2, 1.3 degrees. A lot of that's due to the El Nino going on in the tropical Pacific. And the graph behind me shows a sort of a separation of the natural fluctuations around the background trend, where you can see all those black wiggles going up and down, um, and the warming that's induced by human activity in orange, and the warming induced by natural fluctuations, fluctuations in the sun, volcanoes going off and so on, which you can see in blue. And when you add these together, you get pretty much all of the uh, multi-decadal, de decade to decade changes in temperatures are explained. And we can see that we've reached a point where human-induced warming is around one degree. And that's going to prove a very useful sort of simplifying uh, concept in terms of understanding the climate challenge going forward. So um, uh, Mark Carney mentioned this challenge of the transition to net zero. Um, and as, as you all know, I'm sure, coming out of the Paris Agreement uh, last year, countries have committed to stabilize temperatures well below two degrees with an aspiration to get to 1.5 degrees if possible. Just to point out on this graph behind me, uh, temperatures have warmed by about half a degree since the 1980s, so in the past 30 years or so. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist. You guys seem to be fond of rocket scientists. I don't know any rocket scientists. Well, actually, I do know some. But anyway, it doesn't even take a climate scientist um, to, to, to say that, well, it, it's not going to be that long before we're heading up towards 1.5 degrees. And if we want to stabilize temperatures at that sort of level, then we are going to need to reduce global CO2 emissions to zero because, um, as, as was mentioned, um, CO2 is a cumulative pollutant. As long as we continue dumping CO2 in the atmosphere, temperatures will continue to rise. So this really highlights the scale of the challenge in front of us and why it's going to start to matter for the global asset management industry. If we look at lots of different scenarios for future emissions, you can see they all agree that we have to get, if we're going to sort of look at a two degree or, or close to 1.5 degree world in the future, we have to get emissions down towards zero by the end of the century. So that's the big picture. But for asset managers, it's, it's not a very helpful picture behind me because it's a rather sort of complicated bundle of spaghetti. And there's increasingly, um, you know, uh, part of the um, Climate Disclosure Task Force is talking, that part of their conversations are increasingly around testing companies' business plans against a two-degree scenario. But one thing you can might, looking at the figure behind me, well, you know, two-degree scenarios, if you look at 2030, sort of just the, the second tick along on that, um, emissions in these two-degree scenarios in 2030, global emissions, range from slightly higher than they are today 
to about half what they are today. So that's such an enormous range that testing a company's business model against a two degree scenario becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, you could probably find uh, an emission scenario to suit you if you want one. So that in itself is not going to be enough, which is why the, uh, that additional sentence in Mark's uh, speech where he highlighted the need for companies to explain their plans for the transition to net zero is so important. I'm going to now just try and simplify this picture a little by taking exactly the same data. These are the standard energy modeling scenarios for how the global emissions evolve under these different futures. And I'm just going to plot the same data in a slightly different way. Instead of plotting the x-axis against time, I'm going to plot it against predicted warming. We know that as emissions continue, temperatures will continue to rise because CO2 accumulates in the climate system. So it's very straightforward to take that data and plot it against committed warming in the future. And here you can see already the strands of spaghetti start to separate out. It starts to get a bit clearer. You see the, the 1.5, the light blue lines heading down towards zero at 1.5 degrees, the two degree ones, the dark blue heading down towards zero at two and so on. And if I just do one more change to the plot, so this, this plot shows you absolute emissions going forward into the future. But these are all scenarios in which um, a, um, uh, a policy has been applied. You know, the, there's, there's been some policy effort made over the coming century to stabilize climate. So we can, instead of taking absolute emissions, we can plot uh, emissions relative to what they would have been in the absence of that policy, so relative to baseline. So I'm just going to change the vertical axis here again. And suddenly, from that bundle of cooked spaghetti you had to start with, we sort of uncooked it. And you're starting to see the handful of straight spaghetti strands um, where the picture is becoming much clearer. We're basically seeing a straight line down from where we are now at baseline. Essentially, climate policies are not really making much difference to global emissions right now down to whatever temperature we're going to stabilize at. And this provides a very effective tool for investors to quiz companies on, if you like, or to explore with companies they own about how the company is planning their transition to net zero. Because what you're seeing here is the consequence of what um, physicists like to call things identities. And an identity is generally something so obvious that when you think about it, you can't work out why anybody would bother to talk about it. But so here's the net zero identity. Um, we're at one degree now. To reach net zero emissions by two degrees, we need to reduce emissions by 10% of baseline for every tenth of a degree of warming from here on. It's completely obvious. Yeah, we've got 10 steps of 10% to get to zero. Hopefully that's... Um, clear enough to everybody in the room. Um, if you want to reach net zero by one and a half degrees, you've got to reduce by 20% per tenth of a degree of warming as we go forward. But of course, what makes this interesting is that right now, a tenth of a degree of warming takes about six to eight years, remembering that plot I showed you back at the beginning. So that gives you a sense of the scale that companies face if they are going to credibly plan a transition to a net zero world. Of course, different companies are going to have to decarbonize at different rates, and we can unpack this. If we look at different sectors, these are just scenarios for the future, looking at uh, the dark blue is industry, sort of generic uh, 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 pool together, emissions from industry. Yellow is transport, and green is electricity generation. And you can see that as temperatures rise, although on average emissions have to head down towards zero in a straight line, Different sectors are expected to decarbonize at different rates. Electricity goes first. And in fact, in another paper which uh, University of Oxford published a couple of weeks ago, uh, we showed that the uh, actual plant required to, to the, that would commit us to two degrees of warming actually will be largely built by next year. So further investment beyond that in uh, capital assets in the energy industry will have to be either zero carbon or assets are going to get stranded if we're going to meet the two degree goal. So electricity has to decarbonize very rapidly. Transport in these scenarios 
goes down much later, but still has to reach zero by the time the warming goal uh, is, is reached. So the, this is the context of all this, and I'd just like to draw your attention to something you can uh, to, to pick up to follow up. Um, the Oxford Martin School is working on this whole uh, business of how investors interact with companies to determine whether their strategies are consistent with a stable climate future. Uh, we've got something called the Oxford Martin Working Principles for Investment in Fossil Fuels, and there's a bunch of these over at the ICMA stand, which you can pick up if you want to follow up on this. Uh, the idea is that we're, gonna, we're sort of encouraging investors, as they talk to companies about their climate-related risk, to ask the following very simple questions. First of all, of a company, at what temperature do you plan for your activities and the products you sell to be consistent with net zero carbon emissions? I, I'd just like to know, is this, a, is this a one and a half degree company, a two degree company, a four degree company? I think companies, it would be helpful to know companies' answers to this question. Even if the company's never thought about this, it might not be a bad idea for them to spend a little bit of time thinking about it, because many companies probably don't even realize that stabilizing climate means net zero carbon emissions. And then, of course, the obvious next question is, okay, well, if that's your plan, what's your strategy for getting there? And finally, of course, because this is the industry which lives on metrics, how do you plan for your performance to be measured as you progress towards net zero? So these are the questions we think investors, long-term asset owners, need to be asking of the companies they hold as we move forward to avoid the risk of systemic instability in resulting from a precipitate transition towards net zero sometime in the middle of the century, which would likely involve very significant asset stranding and losses to investors. And I hope there'll be some questions on this, um, so I'm very happy to take questions at this point. Thank you. Hello. Have you had difficulty in getting information from companies on how they're planning on reducing their emissions? And what, what tools have you used to, to prod them? We, we're an academic operation, so we come at this from, from the other end, from what the climate needs, if you like. This is the information that investors need. They're not getting it. At the same time, companies are devoting, some, some companies at least, are devoting enormous amounts of energy and, and you know, analyst time and so on to disclosing the details of their present-day carbon footprints and getting quite reasonably sort of a bit hacked off with this because they can realize that this activity is you know, largely bean counting and they can't quite see where it's going. So you know, what's needed is this forward-looking disclosure, um, which... At, the mo at present, you know, we are talking very long timescales compared to uh, the typical uh, timescales that company disclosures apply to. Um, it, it, it can be very qualitative. It can be just a you know, very broad brush, but, what, but a, a little bit of qualitative information on the company's plans for the far future would be infinitely more valuable than lots of detail on their scope one, scope two, scope three emissions today. And that's what we're not getting. So I'm, I'm very pleased to say that the Carbon Disclosure Task Force, the, the, the Climate Risk Disclosure Task Force, has taken this on, and they have put forward-looking disclosure at, at the head of their ask of companies. We're in the process of working with the Climate Risk Disclosure Task Force, actually, on precisely the question of what that forward-looking disclosure ask will, will look like. Um, we appreciate, obviously, from, from your side, there's a limit to what companies can disclose about their long-term uh, uh, future, but there are certain issues that are relatively obvious. I mean, if a company is investing a lot of its shareholders' capital in exploring for new fossil reserves, uh, then they ought to have some kind of plan as to what's going to happen to the carbon generated by those fossil fuel reserves, and their shareholders probably deserve to know what that plan is. At the moment, most companies involved in the extractive fossil fuel sector probably don't feel, don't, aren't obliged to disclose that plan. And, and that's a, a conversation I think would be use, could be very usefully had. That's just one example. Thank you very much. Um, no wishing to make the story feel more depressing, but just wondering whether you've looked at this. Obviously, we're all in the hopeful space of growing our businesses, and we have a growing population. Is there any sort of metric in terms of your, your uh, impact versus um, you know, the growth of your expected profit growth or your business growth in order to 
adjust for the fact that we have a, um, you know, a, a globalizing world. And, and obviously, if you're going to be more active in emerging markets or lower carbon markets, actually your business as usual needs to almost move even faster. Yes, um, I, I think what we, what we haven't seen, the reason I'm optimistic about this, I don't think we've actually asked the industry to really try yet. Um, and the, I, I think it's actually very unhelpful to frame the problem as a sort of belt tightening exercise that we've got to, um, you know, the, 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 the ultimate way to reduce emissions, as we all discovered in 2009, is to get poorer. Um, and let's face it, the world is not going to go with that solution. We've got to work out other ways of, of doing this. Uh, I think private enterprise is the way to find those solutions. And I think that's why it would actually be very helpful to get companies' minds. There are smart people in these companies. They can work. That's what they do. They solve problems. I have no idea. I do not take a position on whether the fossil fuel industry will be as big as it is today in 50 years' time. What I do know is it will have to be net zero carbon emitting um, in not long after 50 years' time if we're going to stabilize climate at one and a half degrees. I don't know if they can do it. It's technically possible. Um, and it's going to be, I, you know, I think we should be empowering the industry to do that rather than um, simply, you know, asking them to get smaller or sort of crawl away and die. So, so I think that, you know, in some ways this net zero challenge is a, it, it's, quite, it, it's quite an optimistic one in the sense that it's not about doing less, it's just about doing things differently. And if we are going to continue to use fossil fuels, and my bet personally would be that we will be continuing to use fossil fuels, we just need to work out different ways of using them such that we don't end up dumping the CO2 into the atmosphere. If you want to follow up, don't forget, you can pick up a copy of these working principles, and they are working principles. It's a draft. We do want feedback from the industry on how we can make this work. And so you can pick up a copy of this from the ICMA stand downstairs over coffee.